Canadian films have not always gotten the respect they would like. Often, good films simply get passed by, overlooked, or most frequently of all, overshadowed by the behemoth film industry of our southern neighbor. Can a new generation of filmmakers flip the script and reframe the narrative around English-Canadian cinema? Let's ask. In Thunder Bay, Ontario, via Skype, Michelle Latimer, director and showrunner of the documentary series Rise. And here in studio, April Mullen, director of Below Her Mouth. Andrew Cividino, director of Sleeping Giant. Kazak Radwanski, director of How Heavy This Hammer. And Charles Officer, owner of Cane Sugar Filmworks and director of Nurse Fighter Boy. And Michelle, it's nice to have you on the line in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Great to have Northwestern Ontario represented here. And to our friends here in the studio, thanks a lot for coming in Thank tonight for, for this us. very uh, important day on the Canadian... National, National Canadian Film Day. National Canadian Film Day, okay. I want to start by getting you all mad at me right away, okay? <laughs> Shall we do this? Here's Simon Haupt writing in the Globe and Mail. With few exceptions, Anglo-Canadians do not go to the theatre to see movies made by their countrymen. The market share of English-language Canadian films at the domestic box office consistently hovers in the 1% to 1.5% range of total ticket sales. Last year, it hit 2%. That translated to a total box office take for all domestic English-language films of $16.3 million, or roughly what the critically panned Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles reboot earned. So we feel your pain. <clears throat> but we want to go to Michelle first on this. And apparently, Michelle, English Canadian movies are not breaking through with audiences. They have this, I guess, reputation of being not very good. And I wonder whether you think that's deserved. Um, no, I don't think that's deserved. I think the things that you see that get wide distribution are often not the things that people necessarily are drawn to see um, in, in theaters. And there seems to be a disconnect between our distribution models and what's being financed versus what people and audiences want to see. Um, you know, and film festivals have been our best friends. That's where many of us sitting on this panel have been able to cut our teeth and actually get our, our films noticed. But unfortunately, there is a, a great... Um, a great divide when it comes to distribution of, of some of the best films that have come out of Canada. April, let me get you to follow up. English Canadian movies in some circles have a reputation for just being not that good and that's why people don't go to see them. Accurate? Canadian films are incredible at the moment. I think we're breaking waves, setting trends all over you know, the world and in the film markets I've been to, the film festivals I've been to, we're innovative, we're raw, we're bold and we just happen to not be seen in our own country. But the rest of the world is definitely recognizing us on a global front, an international front. It's just in our home turf. Well, the percentages are true. And I think that's the problem, is the disconnect between Canadian cinemas and perhaps not being able to be showcased in a way that we should be. Charles, how disappointing is that for you that your films might get more attention overseas than they actually will in your home country? It's, uh, it's the classic story of like, you know, certain artists having to leave this country to find their footing. And, and uh, yeah. Canada's, long before I've started making film, it's been the story of, uh, of, of films and, and filmmakers and, and the work not really getting the respect here in their country. And I think that, uh, as Ma Michelle has mentioned in April as well, it's just uh, there is a large disconnect with how films are distributed. And, and uh, it's wonderful to, to, to acquire some international partners and, 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 and people who actually recognize your work. But, you know, we live here. We are the, we, we, you know, we apply for funding, we try to raise, we want to tell stories that are indigenous. And, um, and there is a disconnect. It's, it's, if you find that distributors or within this country, if, if, if they're, you're taking meetings and, and they're literally saying, we're only going to possibly take two films, Canadian films, a year. Two a year? Two. They'll literally tell you that. Huh. Um, and, um, well, that's kind of tricky. Well, then, do, do you even care about the Canadian industry? Do you care about actually, you know, um, really trying to take Andrew, uh, when Andrew exploded on, on the scene, it's like, you know, there should be a mad rush to find out who and what he's thinking to do next and getting behind and nurturing that filmmaker to actually, you know, move forward and get to their second and third and, and um yeah, take an interest. If they don't care, then the rest of the candidates are going to care. What is that about, Andrew? Why, why, you know, why would you have a situation where a guy says, I don't care how great the movie is, I'm taking two Canadian flicks this year, period, full stop? Yeah, well, I think there, there are two things. One, there is definitely, there is some stigma around English-Canadian cinema, and I think, I mean, it, it is in part because there, 
look, we, I think we have some amazing films. They're definitely, we have also made mediocre films. And I think that there's this double-edged sword where maybe sometimes we get behind and we celebrate mediocre films too, like because we're really trying to get the films out there. And, and so maybe that adds to the stigma. Uh, but I think there is this generation of filmmakers that's coming up right now that is making waves on the international scene and really making interesting work. And the question is, well, then why aren't people still, why are we still not going to watch them? And I think that's, I mean, that's a question with a, a number of answers. One of them is marketing related. The reality is that a Canadian film, however good it is, is never going to be marketed on the same scale because it is a matter of scale. What is the marketing budget on your film? The marketing budget on my film <laughs> is bigger than the budget of the movie and it's still very small. I think we, I mean, we, ha we had support of Telefilm and a distributor who were really behind the film. So you have uh, a, a couple of hundred thousand dollars being spent across the entire country to try to market a film. Which you're trying to compete with, move, with American uh, big pictures. With about a hundred million dollar right. marketing budget. Tough. And, and that whole campaign gets thrust from that American release mm -hmm. over to the Canadian release. Mm -hmm. And it, it's something that's happening internationally. It's not just here. The middle of that film industry is falling out as, as, as sort of the, the American system collapses into these tent poles mm -hmm. where it's as important to spend the hundred million dollars on marketing as it is to make the movie because the marketing is what sells it. Right. Kaz, let me follow up with you on this. We heard Charles a moment ago refer to this disconnect between the fact that good movies are being made, but good movies somehow can't find their place in the cinema and therefore cannot be seen. Yeah, yeah. Why no, does I, this disconnect happen still? Because I think um, it's exciting what's happening right now in English Canada. I think it's hard to keep up with. I think it's new. I think it's dynamic. And I think it's hard to find um, one way to market it or to keep up with, I think. I think we need to find new ways to support these filmmakers um, that are innovating. Seems um, to be the case, though, that, that, well, it's true. There are hundreds upon hundreds of crappy films made in the United States every absolutely. year, yeah. but people still go to see them, and they still have massive publicity budgets, and they have their place, uh, you know, on the movie-going continuum. Yeah. Canadians seem to take pleasure in pointing out that when we make a stinker, well, it somehow speaks for the whole industry. Why is that? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't know why. Why that is. Um, Anybody got a thought on that? Yeah. I mean, I think, that seems I very think, unfair. I think we're harder. I think we're harder as Canadians. I think there's such a. I've always felt like you know Canada has this sort of space where, where I see us like you know the UK or you know Belgium, <laughs> you know, in terms of the kind of size of the films that we make per per you know on the average and um, and 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 it feels like you know. There, you know, people talk about Get Out as well. Like, you know, it's a great film, $5 million and how much it's made, $100 million. At the bottom. Again, it comes back to this marketing sort of space. Get Out is this American picture. American yeah. picture that's, that's done extremely well. But, you know, I think they, I believe they spent $15 million in marketing it. So three times the actual budget of the yes. picture. Yes. They spent yes. marketing. So it's like, you know, we go on in this in our systems where we're, 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 we're building systems for emerging filmmakers to to work. I think it all comes down to like how are we managing with the telefilms and so on? How are we how are we gonna manage our money that we have to make you know to support filmmakers? So in order to get a you know, to use that money that we they don't have a lot of, they have to, you know, in, uh, I guess try to get people to make really low budget films. Uh, of a certain budget, and so they can spread this money out. And it's like, you know, there is a saying, fewer and better. So, you know, I, I think there's, you know, you can really analyze these projects in a certain aspect and actually really try to um, really think about actually the business model beyond making the film. Well, let me follow up with Michelle on that. You know, if, if you live in a, a big city like Toronto or Ottawa uh, in the province of Ontario, you know, you've got a shot at getting your movie into a cinema for a week, maybe. Uh, you know, if it's a big blockbuster, uh, maybe a little longer. How, you're in northwestern Ontario today. Uh, how tough is it to get any screen time in smaller cities around the province? Well, it's really interesting you'd say that because today's Canadian Film Day, and I actually wanted to go see my friend film, uh, my friend's film, Sherry White, who, who uh, wrote the film Maudie. And I looked at the one cineplex that you have here, and it's Silver City, and it's literally Disney movies and one big superhero blockbuster, and that's all you can see. Um, I see that as a problem. You know, we're in Northern Ontario. Andrew shot his film here. It's a beautiful place. A lot of really talented people come out of these smaller centers in our country. How do we celebrate our culture if we don't actually have 
have a space to do that. I'm, I'm seeing that particularly um, because places like Telefilm and that, they measure success by numbers that come to the cinema. And yet we, I've had great success with my films, showing them in community centers, showing them in church basements, showing them at tribal offices, um, connecting with the audiences, indigenous audiences, audiences that are harder to reach in other places. And, um, and But we can't measure that. It's not quantifiable in the eyes of our funders. April, I wonder if that's the option going forward. You, you haven't had luck getting into the big, you know, silver cities and the big cineplexes and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you have to figure out different ways of getting your movie out there? Of course, from day one, on our like this is, you know, 10 years ago, our very first feature film, we took it coast to coast and played rock, paper, scissors, or these championships across every university in town and eventually got distribution through that, through awareness and social media. And back then it was very little, but I think out of the box, marketing strategies and going out towards the audience and finding them and bringing your film in new innovative ways, which we're lucky now because it's a lot less and there's like a lot of social media that can help us. But that is definitely an option. But I don't think that solves our biggest problem, mm -hmm. which is Canadian films should have a percentage allocated in Canadian cinemas. Like I think that needs to be implemented in a very hard way so that when we go to the theater, we will always have an option to see a Canadian film. Like I think there's a solution in there and um, we'll, we'll still be fighting for those spaces, but... Well, and there are countries that have that set as a precedent. France, France exactly. is in, France. And it's it's incredibly diligent model. about it. French and, Canada. Yeah, and they, they put out really quality films because what, what you do is you carve out a space. And again, if it's only the Disney movies that are, that are available to be seen, and they're great, but if that's all that's available, that's going to cultivate what people actually want to see. It's mm -hmm. going to be like... It, it, it locks things off so that there is no space. Can I just understand how this would work? Like, yeah. If you've got, for example, a 10-screen Cineplex, mm -hmm. are you saying that, that one screen has got to be there for a Canadian movie all year long, or what are you saying? Well, it's, it's on the theatrical side. It's on the, it already exists to a degree on the broadcast side, uh, but places like Netflix that are, are becoming the new behemoths of the sort of future of distribution, are, like that's an unregulated space where they have zero quota. And I think when you look at countries that are putting out what we consider foreign film, which is kind of how we have to consider ourselves, mm -hmm. we're, we're not a little version of the American system and we never will be. We have much more in common with the Netherlands, with, with France, with these yes. other countries. We just happen to have the English language, which is actually a, another disadvantage. So I, I think that, that's how we need to frame it. Kaz, let me follow up with you on that. Can you, I mean, we do it for television, we do it for radio. We say if you want a license, you are obliged to play X percent of music on the radio or shows on television that are quote unquote Canadian. Can we do that to theater owners? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I think theater owners need it. I mean, I feel like the landscape everywhere in the States too is becoming tentpole. I, I feel like the theater culture is dying. I think we need to create a space for films to exist. I think a film needs to be floating around in Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver for a month or so for people to be able to find it for word of mouth to be able to spread. You know? Now the argument would be though that, that television and radio airwaves are owned by the public. Therefore they have a public mission which justifies our forcing them to play Canadian content, maybe against their will in some cases. Uh, movie theaters are privately owned. The same public mission is not there. Therefore can you hold them to the same kind of standard? We should find a way, I think. I think it would be healthy. Yeah. Um... I didn't know that there was that technicality or that difference, but... Uh, this conversation's been, yeah. this conversation's been going on for a while. This been going on for a while with our cinemas and, and, and so on, and, 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 you know, allocating space for these films, because, again, if we're looking at the idea of marketing a film, and you, if you're lucky that you get your film in the cinema and it, and it, and it gets to two weeks, there's, it's like all the promotion ends. There, there's nothing else that continues to push it. And and uh, to let people know further, and then it's out of the cinema, and and then the next one comes in. I think this conversation about actually allocating space for for Canadian Indigenous projects to have that space has been going on for a long time, and I and I think that it takes someone like you know. Um, um, Ms. Jolie, uh, or, or, or heritage our heritage minister, um, even addressing this whole thing with Netflix and not paying taxes, like in every company. Yeah pays taxes you know what I mean not so not Netflix and um, and so there we need folks like that and tell them and, and it's all great to have these pledges about diversity and all this stuff but you can make space and create programs to have people learning how to make films and maybe get that for if it has no place to go well but let me ask Michelle this you know in, in, in Toronto where you might have 300 screens in town or Ottawa same situation mm -hmm. uh, okay that's one thing what do you do in Thunder Bay or what do you do in Timmins, or what do you do in Sudbury, where you might have two cinemas in the whole 
city. Yeah, I think most people are watching things online. And then um, a big a, a friend to filmmakers has been uh, these smaller festivals that have year round programming that really engage. Like I'm up in Thunder Bay now because I have a screening tomorrow night that is an event screening. We're showing films that have actually been streaming on the internet for three months now. Mm -hmm. But people are still, the screening's close to sold out because people still want to come recognizing that it's a communal space. We're in involving a panel of speakers afterwards to discuss the topic of the film and it becomes more of an event that you're going to. And I think that's something that we can offer, you know, where we can gauge our community. Yeah, we can sit home and watch our computers and say, I watched this great documentary last night. But it's not the same thing as when you engage in a community space. And that's what really jazzes me when I go to a film festival or when I go to a theater. It's this feeling of experiencing something together in a space that is for, for all of us. And I think that's really what, what the, the, the cinema offers. Somebody referenced uh, Telefilm earlier, which is uh, obviously a national organization that helps fund Canadian productions. And uh, I guess there's a debate going on about whether or not what they do actually results in good or bad work. And to that end, I want to read something here from Kevin Funk and TIFF.net, who writes, the institutional and corporate conditions that exist in this country very much shape the films that get made. I can speak from experience, he says, at length about the radical disinterest that Canadian distributors and broadcasters generally have for the type of films that you are appealing to filmmakers to make. That same indifference exists to a more relative degree within the nation's cultural funding bodies. Not only is there often a contemptuous rebuttal of bold, culturally invested work, there is an incentivized path to mediocrity. In fact, it's celebrated. Andrew, explain to me how getting a grant out of Telefilm somehow incentivizes a path to mediocrity. Well, I mean, I, I think I, I'm always, it's such a delicate ground to tread because I think Telefilm is such an important institution um, and it's easy to, to make it sound irrelevant when it's not. It, I think it does need some, some shifting and some, some work though. I think what, what Kevin's referring to is that idea of maybe trying to make things more America and pretending that we're like a little studio that's going to make movies that are going to somehow break through in, in that space as opposed to really focusing on like emerging voices and, and bold cinema and taking those chances. Because the reality is we'll, we'll never go up against that 100 million wall we were talking about. Mm. But what we can do is make things that are daring, that punch through and play at Cannes or play at Sundance mm -hmm. and find their international audience through that festival circuit. But they have to be singular, and that means taking risks. And that's where uh, the, the mindset of the funding bodies needs to go and not sort of steering toward more conventional fare. Can you just follow up on that and, and tell us about the process you went through in order to get public funding for your movie? Right. Uh, well, for my movie, I tried for a very long time to get public funding uh, for my movie. And eventually, um, Matt Johnson, who is another filmmaker, made a film called The Dirties, sort of outside of the system for about for no money. Uh, and I sort of decided, well, I kind of have to do the same thing. So we got an Arts Council grant, which has a cap of $60,000. Uh, and that, that became sort of the backbone of a very, very minimal, like, you can't repeat it again. It's blood, sweat, and tears kind of way of getting a first film made. Uh, and once it was, was sort of together, Telefilm did come on, see its value, and support it in the post-production phases, and particularly in the rollout of the film. But from a production standpoint, we sort of had to go around the system because what we wanted to do uh, wasn't seen to be fundable. Is it useful and or helpful for Telefilm to come in at the 11th hour that way? Uh, well, I mean, look, a lot of people can't finish their films properly. You can shoot a film well, but you still have, like, post is an expensive process. Mm. So that's absolutely a value, uh, but there is... I, I wouldn't want to encourage cherry picking projects that have already crossed the finish line. Gotcha. Uh, Either of you two have to go for public funding? Go through the process of seeking public funding to do your pictures? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. April, how did it go? Well, I've been fortunate. Like, again, my first feature, they didn't. But then after that, after you sort of have a proven track record, it gets a lot easier. But that also is a lot of incentive for young filmmakers to be innovative and find their own funding. And if, you know, it's kind of like the Maverick filmmakers, that also gives you your muscles and strengths as a filmmaker. So I don't think that your first film, you know, coming in at post, I think is incredible. And it's an amazing thing to have um, at your fingertips. That being said, you know, you slowly but surely go up in budget level. And I don't know about that quote because Telefilm also is doing very risky, brave, bold content. We did a 3D film when they had never done 3D before. I just did a rated R, very rated R, racy, very, you know, content that 
in a country, you know, where we were supported by government funding. So how can I ever dismiss being encouraged? So what's so that one called? Below her mouth. Oh, yes. that's that one. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, you know, made by an all-female crew, a very rated R, a lot of nudity, a lot of intimacy, celebrating the female orgasm, all of these things, How but it was funded by the, you know, the, the funding agencies. Did, you, did people get to see it? This is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is playing all over the world, it, and it went to theaters. It did. It did well um, in Canada. Elevation released it, but, you know, I bet very few people have heard of it. Does it live on... Netflix or any It's of on other? iTunes right now, it's and it will iTunes. be on all those other uh, avenues very soon. Yeah. Kaz, what's your experience on this? Yeah, the same as Andrew's uh, with uh, Sleeping Giant, micro budget, um, mainly self-funded and Arts Council funding. Um, and I'm happy to work that way. Um, I'm, I like making small films. I'm passionate about it. But I think it's dangerous when I become an example and Andrew becomes an example because you know we're white, middle class males. I mean, how are we going to get a truly diverse cinema? How, how are, like, truly independent voices going to be able to do what Andrew and I did, you know? Michelle, gonna... I see you nodding at that. I just really appreciate what Kazakh said because I think we're talking about two very different things. I think one of the things that very few people know is that the way telefilm looks at things is they have script readers. Those script readers read scripts and they give coverage and that coverage plays a very important part. It's like a book report on your script and it gives a very, it's a very important part of what gets your film made or not made and funded or not funded. And if you only have... A people of a certain experience, whether it's class, race, gender, and that's their experience, and they're reading your script, but yet, let's say you come, your script is all in Cree, and it's about a northern community, um, and, and, and someone reads that, and they just don't understand. They just can't relate. They could say, no, I don't think we should make this into a film. Well, that just cuts up a whole community of people whose stories are valid and that brings diversity it reflects a, a huge part of our culture as canadians and so this is a very important thing it's a different story when we're talking about sort of white male storytelling versus um diversity across across uh, culture let me follow up with charles on that did, yes. did, have you ever had to change a script or <laughs> bevel any edges in order to make yourself more eligible for grants or that kind of thing funny you should ask steve uh, <laughs> Nurse Fighter Boy was very interesting, just as Michelle mentioned about this coverage and, and so on and so forth. When I got my first uh, report back um, from Telefilm uh, about Nurse Fighter Boy, they thought I was talking about some unnamed Caribbean country. I was talking about the east end of Toronto where I grew up. What did that tell you? Well, there's a disconnect that people are actually, and, and, and you know, I was dealing with a particular um, disease called sickle cell anemia, and it was very interesting how how folks found it interchangeable to just be cancer. And why can't I just cast someone but, white? Yeah, but because it is particular to the black community. It's, it's, yeah, I'm talking about something specific. Yes. So if, uh, you know, if you're not, it, as well, like, you know, there's a reason why I haven't made another narrative feature film since Nurse Fighter Boy. How long ago was that? That was in two, it came out in 2000, Film Festival in 2008, and was so released in 2009. So is it a question and of just being utterly frustrated with the system? No, no? It's, it's, it's because I spent three or four years pushing stories that are, I think, uh, have deserved space and are just as valid. And, and the questions and the criteria that has been imposed upon these stories is, where's the market? Hmm. Who's going to come see them? And, um, and uh, could we possibly shift some of these, uh, these, uh, these characters into another world? How do you react to that when you get that pushback? Well, I, I um, at the time, you know, going through that that process, I was a little younger, and uh, and I took it in. I wouldn't go and 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 re reimagine the work, but um, it's actually taken me away from from actually pursuing. I got exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot. I have a you know, in, in Canada, there's you can have a lot of meetings that, that a lot of meetings and a lot of talk, <laughs> and um, and at the same time, you know, there isn't really an investment. Um, you know, right now this whole diversity conversation, and and you're seeing how, you know, um, you, Michelle, I'm I'm sure that you're you're feeling it too about how how um, culturally, you know, we're, we're, we're saying that we're recognizing that there is this, this, this missing component to who we are as Canadians. As, you know, Trudeau is talking about we are, we are the most welcoming and, and this is this, you know, multicultural nation and so on and so forth. What we see on television in our films uh, on the regular did, absolutely does not reflect it, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I do what I do, why I'm here, mm -hmm. is because um, it's, 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 it's not a checkbox. 
if you were invested in actually diversity, in actually leveling the playing field with women who 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 deserve space to actually have work. Now, uh, on that issue, there aren't a lot of women of color and diversity in that in that in that conversation itself. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can you can kind of create a program and, and and have a young diverse woman kind of come through. And again, my question is is where's the follow up and where are they going? What are people just actually you know looking at check boxes and uh, and and fit a, and 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 answer? It's really kind of complicated. Where I'm seeing that it's 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 uh, frustrating, but it's also like you know we have to find other innovative ways to 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 make our things because I can't we can't wait for people to change their minds. So, Cass, what are we going to do about this? I, I think yeah, we just have. I mean, my instinct would be to learn from what's working from from the learn from the new filmmakers that are. are uh, trying to figure out you know, what, how do we get new films from 25 year olds, 26 year olds coming out of film school, like, mm -hmm. a way for them to um, not wait in 10 years of development and to empower them somehow um, and to be able to look at their work with fresh eyes. I think uh, rebooting is a good word, but I think Canada is constantly rebooting. I feel like it's a, 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 a country that's always changing. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I mean, I grew up in Toronto, and every 50% uh, of the city is foreign-born. Um, everyone in my class, you know, I was constantly learning about other backgrounds and other people. That's that's normal for Canada. So I think we need an agency that can constantly learn and uh, and change and, and find ways to make these films. April, can we give people some sense of the dollar figures we're talking here? We we know, I guess, because lots of people read People magazine and the National Enquirer or whatever. We know that you can basically spend 150 million dollars to make a awful movie in the United States that has lots of CG and all of that. What do you spend on your movies? Our budget ranges, I'm assuming everybody's everything from 100,000 through post to like 2.5 on the high end. 2.5 you know, million. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, that is basically our, And how do you do that? Part. How do you make a movie for 100 grand? A lot of passion, <laughs> and I would say a lot of time. It's like you said, it's ta it takes, I haven't made a film in two years either. It takes three years of a very passionate team to keep the motivation going because it's not, you know, it's not an easy process to get it funded, to get it out there, and then to get it distributed. It's, it's you know, it's, the reality is it's a very difficult thing in the end. Are you so, more artist or business person at this stage? I'm half-half. I'm split, baby. You are. Yeah, <laughs> you have to be because otherwise you wouldn't, you know, and I think part of the solution when you said what is the solution, it is just keep making films, whether it be in an innovative way, find new ways to fund your features, uh, team up with other countries and co-productions and uh, pre-sales if you have to, but there are new innovative platforms that you can fund features through and you just have to be very tenacious. Mm -hmm. And you do have to be sort of business-minded as well as creative-minded, which, you know, that again is a tug-of-war and in itself. Michelle, let me ask you about one of those options because uh, I, I guess I saw a really fabulous quote-unquote Canadian movie a couple of years ago called Room, which was based on Emma Donahue's novel. And uh, the... The kid won an Oscar for that, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, the, um, the mom won an Oscar mom for that. Oscar. The mom won the Oscar for that. But the kid was fabulous, too. He won a CSA award he for that. He won a, a candy, yes, yeah. that's right, a candy as they call year. it. Is, is, is that, is that the, I mean, part of the solution going forward is that we got to make... Now, that was an Irish-Canadian co-production. Do we have to get more countries involved in helping us make our movies? I think it depends what the story requires to tell it. I don't think necessarily, but that's always a good option. Um, you know, I have, I'm working on something right now that will be a co-production, but the story dictates that. And so I think it's always important to look at what are your expectations? What's the story you're telling and what's the best way to do that? But I'm sort of with Kaz, like I, I, I think there's a lot of freedom in making smaller films. I don't think we should be isolated to that. We should be able to dream big. If I want to make a superhero action film, and I should be able to do that. But I do like the freedom that comes with um, working in a smaller, uh, a more tight-knit community um, and with smaller budgets that allow me the creative freedom um, to do what I want to do. Okay, we got a few minutes left here, and I want to go around the literal and metaphorical table up in Thunder Bay. <laughs> Let's start with Michelle. Uh, you can't name one of your own movies, but I want you to tell me what your favorite Canadian movie of all time is. Go ahead, Michelle. That's pretty easy for me. David Cronenberg's Naked Lunch. <laughs> I, right love, I love that film. Right on. Okay. Yeah. Charles? Um, oh, boy. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to I'm put on the spot. I, I guess, you know what? I, I, I thought about this uh, a little bit, and um, I guess I, I, got, I got to say... I, have, I got a couple, right? So, but I'm going to really throw out something because people have, don't know it and whatever. I'm going to say Soul Survivor by, uh, by uh, Stephen Williams. When did that come out? 
it came out, uh, he also went to the Canadian Film Center. He's been mm. one of the producers and created a show called Lost. He's a Canadian. Okay. And people don't even know he's Canadian. Mm -hmm. He came up with Clement Virgo at a time and so on and so forth. And, and, um, and he's a guy that, uh, that I, I, I just think has done some amazing things and he remains kind of anonymous here. <laughs> Not anymore, you just changed that. <laughs> Kaz, how about you? Um, I'm going to say my favorite Canadian film of the past 10 years uh, is a film called 8888 by Isaiah Medina, uh, a filmmaker from Winnipeg, 24 years old, but uh, played at Locarno, played at New York, played everywhere. He's, um, I think this is the film we're going to be talking about in 20 years. I think he's one of the filmmakers that's, you know, reshaping the language. Fantastic. Andrew. I mean, that answer could like shift minute by minute. I think there, there are just, it's like, what's your favorite song? It's a really difficult question. So at uh, this minute. Yeah, at this minute, <laughs> I'll go with, with Ensemble, uh, uh, Denis Villeneuve. Ensemble, film. right, yeah. right. I, I really think that's a beautiful film. But again, it's, it, I could give you a, like a long list. How many years ago was that now? Is that five, ten years ago already? Uh, Sunday? Yeah, yeah, not, not about, that, yeah. about four or five. Four or five? I think yeah. it was like a 2010. Because Polytechnique was about that. It's interesting. A Quebec movie, eh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He was on my list too. Well, August oh, 32nd can... on Earth was one of my top ones. And if I was to say a third one, it would have been Gammon Gods and LSD by Peter Metlin. <laughs> I, I would actually, say that as well. yeah. I my second too. Like I yes. watched that three-hour yeah. film. I went to I went to Burning Man in the yeah. Desert with that guy. <laughs> it. Like I did. It's interesting. Uh, None of what we've said today actually applies to the province of Quebec, where they've got a very mm -hmm. healthy. Well, like maybe some of it, but not much of it. Much of what we're talking about here is an English Canadian phenomenon. Okay, yes. what's yours? I'm going to say Canadian films that made an impact throughout my uh, The Fly, All the Gone Pete Tong. Okay. I loved All Gone when it came out. Great. It was incredible. Um, War Witch. I loved that, and most recently, Mummy, for sure. Now, when you say The Fly, you, yes. not the original, obviously, you mean what, the uh, Jeff Goldblum? Cro Cron Cronenberg. Cronenberg yeah. version. Okay. And that counts as a Canadian movie. I don't know. It's David that, Cronenberg. That counts as a Canadian it's movie way more than Room counts. I yes. agree. I agree. Okay. Room, okay. room oh, is right. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Room was, is a tough one. I, I hate to pull it away from, back to what you said before. Okay. But those minority co-productions, they work, that is a business relationship and it brings filmmaking to the industry here. Shot in Toronto. But, yeah, but but I think the idea Canadian of actors. us like a glomming on, in supporting, like like the kid was a Canadian. Yeah, kid was Canadian. Uh, and that, but but the, I mean, the key crew, like the whole thing, it's, it's that's really problematic when we start to glom on to minority co-pros because they're successful and be like, oh, that's Canadian. Because th like those are Canadian like on on paper movies mm -hmm. like Room in Brooklyn great and I'm happy that they're here and that we're a part of it but I th I think that that that's a whole separate thing from well, you, you guys as production. filmmakers would understand the concept of cut we're out of time that's the <laughs> wow. uh, I want to thank you all for coming in both in uh, points far away Michelle thanks for being there for us in thank Thunder you Bay for and to all of our friends here in the studio uh, you know what do we say to the audience but go see a Canadian film it's never been easier and um, you won't get hurt. You won't get hurt, yeah, and you've heard some good suggestions <laughs> here tonight. So, even as Nike iTunes. says, yeah. <laughs> even on iTunes, just do it. Thank Thanks, Thanks so everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.